The Priestly Society of St. Pius X, founded in 1970. What does the Vatican say about their status? And what does canon law say? This is a controversial question, no doubt, especially on social media, YouTube, other sources. And I wanted to have Father Paul Robinson from the Priestly Society of St. Pius X to come back and talk about their canonical status and whether or not Catholics may receive sacraments from the Society of St. Pius at the 10th. This is, a, in a way, part two. Uh, Father Robinson came on and did a great job on the history and the biography of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre and of the Society. And that led a lot of people saying, okay, well, now talk about the big question, and that is, what is the canonical status of SSPX, and may we attend their liturgies? So, we're doing it today. Father Paul Robinson, welcome. How are you? Doing well, Taylor. Thanks so much for having me back on. Yes, thanks for coming on. Before we begin, uh, and, and Father, please lead us in the Potter Noster before we begin. Um, when we had done our first interview, Father Robinson, I had never attended any liturgy, rite, sacrament, mass of the Society of St. Pius X. However, as we've gotten into this corona situation, it became manifest to me that the only way that our family would be able to receive the sacraments, namely confession, but especially the Holy Eucharist, was through the local Society of St. Pius X. So our family, thanks be to God, has been availing ourselves of that option, and we've been blessed uh, in the end of Lent, uh, Passion Sunday, Palm Sunday, uh, Easter, and then yesterday, Low Sunday. We've been very blessed. It's been a very good um, experience for us, and a lot of people online have attacked us and maligned us and called us schismatics and now I'm feeling everything that you've probably felt for the past <laughs> several decades. Um, but, I, you know, I feel that I could, I could happily stand before our Lord Jesus Christ with a clear conscience because I've done the research. I, I feel like I have a pretty good handle on what the CDF has said and the Ecclesia Dei and, and canon law. Um, and, but I want other people to walk through that and to see that because most people are just told you guys are schismatics, you're sede vacantist. You're outside the church. Uh, you're a problem. You're not a solution. And for our family, when everything shut down within a 500 mile radius and there is no mass, the only people who are, or the only priests who are flying in from out of state and doing four masses in a row and communion rites and confessions all day, for us, where we live, it's the society. And so I'm grateful for that. And uh, I wanted to give. Uh, you, Father Robertson, a platform to walk everybody through the, the, the canonical status. Not pull any tricks. Go through the canonical status over time. So let's do it. And uh, Father, would you mind opening us with the Pater Noster or any, or any other prayer you'd like? And uh, we'll begin. In nomine Patri, se fidi e spiritu sancti, amen. Pater Noster, qui es in ceri, sancti viceto, nomen tuum, advenia, regnum tuum, Via voluntas tua, sicut in cero et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et imite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. In nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. All right, Father, so what's the answer, yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> are, are we good guys or bad guys <laughs> exactly are the good guys or the bad guys <laughs> well i i think this certainly um this is a very complicated question and and i think one of the things that that everybody uh must understand when perhaps many of your viewers are um seeing a society priest for the first time or, or getting the society's uh version of of the story for for the first time um, and the, the, the main thing to be understood is, is that just like everybody else, we, uh, we want to save our souls. I mean, I, I think that's, that's really what uh, we're wanting to do in this very, very difficult situation, just like so many people today uh, in, in the, the light of this pandemic. The, the, the number one thing they want to do, uh, and they, they grab toilet paper or whatever at the, at the grocery store in order to achieve it, um, is they, they want to, to live. You know, they want to save their lives. Um, so I, I think... Really, um, people have to understand that that has motivated, that has been the primary motivator for the decisions that were made by Archbishop Lefebvre 
and those those who have followed him, um, we, we we definitely want to save our souls. And um, it's just that this this crisis in the church has made it more difficult. Um, so a, a lot of people um, just look at, at, at this situation at a very superficial level, <clears throat> and they they just say, well, I mean. Um, the Pope has has uh, condemned you, therefore it's the end of the story, uh, without making any other distinction. And I, I think the easiest way uh, and the simplest way to win an argument is just take a label and stick it on somebody's forehead and, and say, end of story, without making any distinctions. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's really important um, when, we, when we approach this discussion that we make the proper distinctions. And... Um, I, I think a good way to approach this is just to 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 say to people, um, can we envision any situation whatsoever in which it would be of advisable to disobey the Pope? Um, is it is it the case that that no matter what the Pope says in any situation whatsoever, we must do what he says? Or are there, in fact, some cases in which um, he goes beyond his power, he can go beyond his power, and we, in, in which we would be obliged to disobey him in order to serve God? I think when we phrase it like that, um, it becomes clear that, that the Pope um, does not have an absolute power such that um, his will binds simply because he is the Pope. Um, but there are parameters in which he must exercise his authority. Um, so if, if I can give a few examples, let's just take some, some extreme exam examples by illustration, by way of illustration. Um, say, for instance, that, that Pope Francis came out and, and he said to all the priests in Brazil, <clears throat> what, I, what I want you to do in order to show solidarity with the Amazonian culture is I, I want you to put a, a Pacamama idol on the top of every tabernacle, you know, in every church in Brazil. Um, so, so if he asked the priest of Brazil to do that, um, would they be obliged to obey? Would, would uh, they be saying to themselves, well, I mean, this is the Pope. Um, and he's the vicar of Christ. And so I must do this, even though it, it um, seems to be violating the rights of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the King. Um, and it seems very clear that they, they would not only would they have a right to disobey such an order, such a hypothetical order, uh, but they would even have a duty to do that. Um, they have to, to serve uh, God over men in, in that case. Um, so, you know, if, if we consider that sort of situation and, and say a priest in Brazil uh, disobeyed uh, the Pope or a bishop disobeyed the Pope and refused to do that, and then later on the, that, that bishop was sanctioned, um, he, he just persisted and, and the Vatican came down on him and said, no, look, you know, if you keep doing this, if you keep refusing to do this, um, we're going to suspend your faculties. Um, and he kept doing that, and then he got suspended, and then later on, uh, an order that he founded, where he was commanded to shut it down. I mean, I, I, th I would think that would be sort of a parallel situation to um, what the society went through and is really still going through. Um, but, I mean, if, if we can just um, frame the, the whole scenario in those terms um, and, and, and start off by saying, um, there are situations in which the Pope um, can overstep his authority, and in those situations, uh, the, the, those who are subordinate to him would have a right to disobey. Um, if we can agree on that, firstly, um, then we can get to, to the second question of, w did the society, was the society in such a case? Was the Archbishop in such a position um, for instance, when he refused to celebrate the Novus Ordo Mass. But I think agreeing on that first uh, step that there are situations in which it's not only lawful, but, but necessary to disobey the Pope, um, that's the first thing that we have to agree upon. Yeah. And, and I think when it, you know, you mentioned not celebrating the Novus Ordo Mass, Archbishop Lefebvre's argument was, on the day of my ordination, this was the Mass I said. And a year later, this was the Mass I said, and 
the the mass I said in 1964 was this mass, and in 68. So why am I now falling under a sanction to say the mass that I said on the day of my ordination? It's not even that he's, you know, law is custom, and to say suddenly that that mass is abrogated or abolished, you you can't even really say he's disobeying the Pope by not saying the new mass because. It's already been established in this case. In the case, we're not talking about a pacamama here. We're talking about a liturgical rite that has been established and ingrained in the heart of the church for centuries. So, you know, because I, I can hear people say, "Well, come on, an idol is different than than a liturgy, right?" But even in this case, you know, to to radically change the Roman rite and say that the previous rite is abrogated—that's a pretty—that's a crisis. That's an emergency. I know a lot of people wouldn't agree with this, but it, it truly is. And I, another thing that I want to add before you continue, Father, is one question is, can we ever disobey a pope? And I think you've established that, yes, we can. And the second one is, has the church been in, the, in a crisis since at least the 1960s? If you don't think the church has been in a crisis, if you think everything was going great, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, th this argument's not going to appeal to you at all. But if you do accept that we've been in crisis, suddenly I think you're able to hear the argument of the Society of St. Pius X. Yes. Well, as I say, that I think if I'm able to, to first of all, just get people to, to sort of see where we're coming from, um, I've already accomplished a lot that that um, on the basis of principle that in theory there are situations in which um, it's necessary to obey the Pope, disobey the Pope. Um, then then we can get to that second question of of was that actually the situation when Archbishop Lefebvre refused to celebrate the, the new mass? And of course, the Archbishop, I mean, many times he would refer to the fact that this is the mass of his ordination, this is the mass that has sanctified the saints for centuries, how could it suddenly be wrong? Um, so that's that's more on a more of a, a practical level, but the archbishop was also, uh, you know, he was a theologian. He he got his, his doctorate in, in Rome, at the French seminary in, in Rome, um, in theology. And so there there were solid principles uh, behind his, his action as well. In other words, he knew the precise conditions under which um, it is necessary to disobey the Pope. And, and effectively, um, that condition is whenever the faith is endangered. Um, so um, if, for instance, the, the Vatican had promulgated a, a mass that um, was, was not at all a, a danger to the faith, and they had used the proper, proper sort of legislative instruments to to abrogate the traditional mass or what have you, um, and you know we we could argue whether that's even possible. But but if they had done that, um, I, I, I strongly suspect that the archbishop would not have had any problem, um, because you know if if the mass that is promulgated represents the constant tradition of the church, um, if it if it truly portrays the sacrificial nature of the mass, if it preserves that respect, that proper respect for the real presence, if it preserves the identity of the priest, um, then it's perfectly in line with the whole tradition of the church. In other words, with the faith itself. Um, it's it's in continuity with that deposit of the faith that's been handed down from generation to generation up to the present day. Um, but if if the mass, if the new mass is a threat to the Catholic faith, um, and by saying the new mass, the archbishop would be endangering his faith, and he would be endangering the faith of those who would assist at his mass or or the priests that he would be forming and so on, um, then he would be in, the, in that condition where um, it would be necessary for him to disobey the Pope. Um, so that's that's really the crux of um, whether someone would agree with the actions he took. Um, is the new mass, in fact, a danger to the faith, or is it not uh, a danger to the faith? If it's a danger to the faith, I mean, is the, is the archbishop obliged to lose his soul? Um, you know, like just like someone um, being asked to contract the coronavirus. You know, <laughs> I mean, if the if the government, I mean, in a crazy situation is asking you to go contract the coronavirus, um, do you say, well, I must obey my governor? 
you know. Um, and it, it was that was sort of the Archbishop's perspective on the new mass. Um, if if I start saying this mass, and that becomes my my daily spiritual nourishment, and it's poisonous, um, then I very well may lose my soul. Um, and I fear losing my soul. I don't want to lose my soul. And I, and I want, I mean, I've been ordained to lead people to salvation. Um, and I've been made by God to, to uh, you know, um, unite myself with God and attain salvation. So um, if the new mass is going to keep me from that, um, then I would not at all be serving God by, by celebrating it, even if the Pope commands it. Uh, a tangential question, and that is, there are, I've met people who are much holier than I and good people who, who have attended the Novus Ordo. Um, and then I've also met people who have grown up in the traditional Latin mass and they're kind of hard to be around. Um, <laughs> can we state that, I, I'm interested in your, maybe this is your personal opinion or maybe there's an official opinion by the Society of St. Pius X. It seems to me if you just look at the demographics and the numbers, people who believe in the real presence, mass attendance, vocations to the priesthood, ever since the new mass, the Novus Ordo mass came out, all of those numbers are in free fall. All of them. Uh, in, in my book, Infiltration, I document all those numbers. Ever since the mid-60s when they start tinkering, everything starts to fall. So there seems to be objective demographic data that the change in the liturgy has some kind of relationship with the loss of faith, loss of vocations, loss of attendance. So I think that's there. But can it be the case that there's pious granny out there somewhere who's going to daily mass Novus Ordo and is a real a real saint? And, and for some reason, uh, the novelties of the new liturgy haven't completely eroded her belief in transubstantiation, uh, you know, ontological character of the priesthood, sacrificial nature of the mass, etc. Absolutely, absolutely. And and when when um, I, as the priest of the society, would would express my opinion and, and the opinion of the archbishop um, that the new mass is a danger to the faith, um, I don't at all want to speak to the people who actually attend the new mass. Um, and and when when I meet someone you know, on a plane or, um, or on, on the, sh on the street in a store or whatever. And they say, you know, I, so who are you? And like, Oh, I'm a traditional priest. I say the Latin mass, you know, down, down in, uh, in Watkins. Um, and they, the, the last thing I would, I would, uh, start the conversation off with is, is saying you must not attend the new mass. <laughs> I mean, that would be very imprudent of me. Mm -hmm. Um, because it takes time to get to that point. Um, this, is, this is a question of uh, being more uh, aware of the dangers of the new mass over time. So I can't expect someone to immediately to be sensible to the fact that the new mass is a danger to the faith. It depends upon um, you know, your, your own particular um, outlook, uh, your, your, your background, and so many complex questions. I would want to help someone get to that point um, but I would immediately shoot them down and say, you must stop attending that right now um, because it, it's a question of developing the conscience. Um, so the, the way I look at it is, is that in, in 1969, when the new mass came along, um, the archbishop had always had a, a very great love for the mass. I mean, that was the center of, of his devotional life. Um, that, that was that was his primary spirituality and characteristic, and, and, and we can in society we can look at our own statutes, and and um, that's what the Archbishop says at the very beginning of our statutes that our spirituality is the Mass, and for that reason the Archbishop was very highly sensitive to any changes that would take place in the Mass. He was very he had he had a, a very strong supernatural sense of of what the Mass was supposed to be. And I think that is what enabled him to see immediately um, that that this mass was very dangerous for the faith, whereas it would have taken others uh, a bit longer. And I mean, um, in, in, in my career as a priest, I, I, I see that when someone comes to the traditional mass for the first time, you have very, very different reactions. I mean, some people come and they're just like immediately they're just like, I'm at home. 
Um, this is what I've been looking for for so long, and I've finally found it. Whereas others are just like, hmm, that was interesting, you know, but um, <laughs> it's, it's going to take longer for them to, to realize um, that this is a much, much more authentic expression of the Catholic faith. Um, and and if, I can, if I can speak personally, um, I, I'm so grateful for my grandfather. Um, when in, in, uh, when the changes came along, I mean, he was he was one of those very spiritual men. Um, and at the time of the changes, he, he went to the new mass a few times and he's just like, you know, I, I can't handle this. This is this is just not uh, nourishing my faith and it's a danger to my faith. Um, and so he found an independent priest in Kentucky who also didn't like uh, the new mass and, and started attending mass in somebody's home, you know, the traditional mass in somebody's home. And if he hadn't done that, um, you know, I, I have no clue where I would be today. Definitely wouldn't. I, I definitely don't think I would be a priest uh, at this moment. Um, I don't even know if I would have the faith. I mean, the, uh, growing up in the 70s, those very, very confusing times. Um, so uh, it's it's not a condemnation of of, of those who uh, attend the new mass, but I think it, it is a fact that that the the more sensible you are of the supernatural realm, the the more heightened your faith is, the more you will realize um, the traditional mass is a, an authentic expression of the Catholic faith, whereas the new mass is very much a, a, a very watered down. Um, uh, I wouldn't even call it a strong expression of the faith, but it's more of a hiding of, of what the faith is. Yeah, I, I put on the screen, you can't see it, Father, but just some some samples of things that are dangerous to your faith. People might say, well, what's dangerous to my faith? How about these? Ripping out altars. Ripping out altar rails. Ripping out tabernacles. Altar girls. Lay Eucharistic ministers. Women lectors heretical hymns, communion in the hand, churches in the round. How about removing the traditional offertory prayers, which designate the sacrificial oblation on the altar? What about having a variety of Eucharistic prayers in which the priest can kind of pick as a DJ? And then even in the Roman canon, the first Eucharistic prayer, you can omit the saints. It's, it's allowing the priest to be a DJ where he's sort of choosing the flow. Instead of obeying the missal, he's now kind of this active participant in creating a liturgy. And, and that, I think, over time tells the priest, well, if you can pick the Eucharistic acclamation and the Eucharistic prayer and the penitential rite, well, you can kind of just do what you want to do. You're the Lord of the liturgy. And all of those things are dangerous to the faith. Absolutely, absolutely. They have a huge impact. I, you know, I just think of the question of communion in the hand. Mm. Uh, I mean, if if you on a habitual basis are, are not kneeling before our Lord Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament and receiving Him in a reverent manner, but but are more handling our Lord right. like you would handle normal food, um, how is it possible to sustain your belief that that this is this is God? over a period of time, because you're not acting like it's God. You're not behaving right. uh, like this is God. Whereas when you when you kneel uh, and when you genuflect, when you go into to the church, when you keep silence in the church, um, when you're in an attitude of reverence during the mass, um, all these things indicate that you're in a very special location and you're adoring someone who's beyond the natural level. Um, and so it's very easy to sustain your faith. But, but if you go to that, that uh, environment where there's that loss of the, of the sense of the sacred, uh, it's, it's, it's a real struggle to maintain that faith over, over a period of time. And as you say, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. We, we, don't, we don't really have to argue um, that the new mass is deleterious to the faith because there was just a statistical freefall um, after the promulgation of the new mass in the number of a priest and nuns leaving the church, the number of faithful leaving the church, the decrease in, in mass attendance. Um, and I mean, we can point to other statistical factors uh, that, that cause uh, the, the people to leave the church, but we all know that the main thing that happened was the radical change in the mass. Um, it's so radical that, that the new mass, really, it's hard to see how 
it matches up with the concert tradition of the church. Um, and so we, we do, I think it, it, it's, it's hard not to put a large measure of the blame for that fallout um, on the new mass itself. Yeah. Well, it, and it's so different because, I mean, I was an Episcopalian clergyman before becoming a Catholic layman. And we had, you know, altar rails and we had a root screen and every, every, whatever you want to call it, liturgy that I celebrated was ad orientum. We even did the elevations above our head. Um, so it was very, it, there was a lot of, of holdovers from medieval Catholic England that were still kind of floating around in this Protestant sect, uh, Anglicanism, Episcopalianism. So, you know, we had altar rails. We received on our knees. And then when I became a Catholic and I started attending Catholic masses, you know, locally and around, you know, the music wasn't chant. It was banal. There was people were in these lines with their hands out. No kneeling, no root screen, no, none of that. And it, I, I remember once thinking, this is the church of transubstantiation, but it just doesn't look like it. Our, our Anglican practice, our praxis seemed more Catholic, even though we didn't have the true faith. And, you know, until finally getting situated uh, in the fraternity of St. Peter and attending the Latin Mass as a family, that was uh, about 10 years ago. Finally, it was like, okay, the, the theology that I came to accept when I rejected Anglicanism and Protestantism, when I, in my heart, believed you know, the anathemas of Trent, when I finally came to that, now my Sunday experience in the liturgy matches that. There's a synergy there. Whereas before, it always felt disconnected. And that's why I'm, I'm always beating the drum on the traditional Latin Mass, because, you know, Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi, I came to the true faith, but I wasn't experiencing that in prayer and in liturgy. And I was worried that my kids would just grow up as cradle Catholics in the Novus Ordo and drift off because they were just sort of getting the communion in the hand, altar girls, etc. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I think that's so indicative of of the fact that that we can hardly blame the archbishop for for doing what he did. I mean, because objectively, he preserved his faith and he preserved the faith of thousands of people by the decision he made. If he had not made that decision, how many people would have lost their souls? I mean, so so again, I mean, in this coronavirus situation, we're, we're um, justifying all these precautionary measures in order to save lives because life is so important. But I mean, the, the salvation of souls is even more important than, than salvation of a physical life. Um, and we can look back and see very clearly that if the archbishop did not make the decisions he made, many souls would have been lost. And, and I think it's to his to his eternal glory that that all these these faithful whom for whom he preserved the traditions of the church in the midst of massive opposition um, are, are going to be eternally grateful to him uh, for that. And it's hard to say to him, you know, you didn't follow the law. You know, you, you didn't do what the Pope said um, be, because, you know, he told you to say the new mass. Um, well, the, the fact is that that um, it was precisely by doing that, by keeping that 1962 missile, um, that he uh, kept the faith and preserved the faith of, of others. There's a, a very... Um, interesting story about about the early days. Uh, this is even before the society had started. And <clears throat> it was in 1969, right about the time the new mass was promulgated. And uh, the archbishop at that time, he, he had seminarians around him who were, who were encouraging him to, to start a seminary and, and start a priestly fraternity. Um, and he, I think they were, they were going to the seminary in Fribourg and he was meeting with them on a regular basis. And uh, it was it was November 26, 1969, and he met with them uh, and in his very characteristic way because as we, we talked about before, he was he was in fact a very meek and humble man. He was not this radical revolutionary. Um, he just said to them, he's like, "We'll keep the uh, traditional mass, won't we? Yeah, I think we'll stick with the with the old mass <laughs> and not go with 
with the new mass. Um, and and that, that decision that he made on that day um, what was so impactful for the history of the church. I think we can see objectively, you know, 51 years later, that huge had a huge impact. If the 1962 missile today may be found all around the world, it was really because of the decision that he made on that day, uh, because the movement that, that he founded, or I, I wouldn't say that the movement that he founded, but, but the priestly fraternity that he founded really is, is what kept uh, tradition going in a, in a very crucial period, that, that period of the 70s and the 80s, um, when everybody was being told there was this, this really strong pressure from the Vatican for everybody to conform to the new mass. So that difficult decision that the Archbishop made to, to stick with the traditional mass, um, I think every traditional Catholic is benefiting from that in 2020. Um, and they, I, I think even those who don't agree with the Society of St. Pius X are often grateful to the Archbishop um, for the fact that he stuck to that traditional mass because they recognized that if he hadn't done that, there was this period of time when the, the mass would effectively have died out and tradition would not be nearly as strong as it is today um, because it, it would have been shut down and re reduced to, to next to nothing. Yeah. Okay, so, so let's go through the canonical history. I think really the big question for people watching is, okay, great. I think there's a crisis. I recognize that uh, the traditional Latin mass, the perennial mass is better and inspires faith and it is the traditional Roman rite. I want that too. Um, and a, a lot of people, Father, that I talk to, I'm going to say I've received hundreds of these emails, notes, direct messages. It goes just like this. I love the traditional Latin mass. My family goes to it every once in a while. It's a two-hour drive, but within 20 minutes of my house is an SSPX, but I just can't bring myself to go to it because I'm nervous. <laughs> can you please give me the reason why I can go there so we can stop driving two hours to somewhere <laughs> far away? So that's really the question that people have. They're like, okay, everything you're saying makes sense, but the Monsignor I know says that they're schismatics. My pastor says they're bad. Don't go there. Some people even say you guys are set a conscious, which is not true. Uh, we need people who are on board. They want to say, show me in canon law, show me in papal documents that it's okay for me to darken the door of the Society of St. Pius X. Because two or three years ago, I was nervous about that. Yeah, well, I think um, there's two different questions are two different historical periods, really, I, I would say. Well, one is, is, is right now in 2020, I think it's very, very clear to everybody um, that it's okay to go to the Society of St. Pius X uh, because of the fact that the, the Pope himself, Pope Francis himself, has given us jurisdiction to, to hear confessions. Um, he's given us uh, authorization to, to witness marriages. Um, and whenever you... Um, give a, a priest faculties, um, you're saying that he's not suspended. Um, he's that not dangerous. He's not dangerous. Um, he is authorized to perform liturgical functions for the church. Now, the Pope hasn't explicitly said that the, the society is authorized to offer Mass, but it's implicit in what he's done by, by authorizing us to offer these sacraments. Um, you know, Bishop Snyder made that, that point that, that um, if you authorize the priest to perform the marriage, then you're author also authorizing the people who are there to attend the nuptial mass right. that goes with that, that wedding. Um, so, but, but even before these uh, moves by Pope Francis to, to give a greater legitimacy to the tra traditions of the church, um, there were statements before that that it clarified that uh, the society, it's okay to attend the society mass. And if I can just read um, some, some statements from before uh, Pope Francis that, that clarify this. So you, you know the, the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei was, was set up effectively um, by, by Rome in 1988 to, to deal with the traditional movement. 
And Monsignor Camille Pearl, he was the secretary of that commission for a while. But in, in 1996, um, he was he issued a, a letter uh, to answering someone. And, you know, sometimes these people write to these commissions and they ask a question and the the secretary writes back. But he makes the letter official um, in order to indicate that this is this is effectively us answering it for everybody. This is not just us answering it for an individual person, but for everybody. So um, he said in this letter of 1996, in the strict sense, you may fulfill your Sunday obligation by attending a mass celebrated by a priest of the Society of St. Pius X. If your intention is simply to participate in mass according to the 1962 Missal for the sake of devotion, this would not be a sin. It would seem that a modest contribution to the collection at mass could be justified. So he's he's saying it's okay for you to go to mass with the society. It's even okay for you to contribute to the support of the society. Yeah. Um, so this is a, an official thing coming from, from Rome even before uh, we were given jurisdiction to perform these sacraments. And what's the year on that? That, that is 1996. Uh, the, a letter he issued in 1996, and it was repeated in a protocol that was issued in 1998, uh, protocol number 236-98, if you want me to, to quote chapter and verse on that one. <laughs> and, and what's interesting about this is, okay, if you're out there saying, Society of St. Pius X is schismatic, the Holy See just told you that you can give money and fund a schismatic cause, if they're schismatic. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't if make sense. If you're putting money in the offer, offering plate, it says that you're you're justified to do that. You are. You, I mean, that's like saying you can give money to the Lutheran Church to expand the Lutheran ministry. No, you can't. No. So this shows that a the society in it, as early as the 1990s is viewed as you can fulfill your Sunday obligation without sin. And if the priest is is for sure suspended. He's offering an illicit mass. This is sinful. So you're now participating in a sinful mass. That's bad. And they're saying you can give money, which also implies that you're giving to a Catholic cause on a Sunday. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, th this is an obvious uh, endorsement of the society. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the critics of the society would say, well, uh, um, still the Vatican says that you're only in partial communion. Um, still the, the, the Vatican says that, that you need canonical regularization. Um, and so they will use that other side, that more legalistic side, uh, to argue that, that it's in fact uh, not lawful to go to the society's masses. And I think that brings up um, a, a larger discussion about the question of, of law um, and when, you know, it's, it's permissible um, to go to, to someone who um, might be in question if there's some doubt, you know, in, in people's minds, um, because this is not a, a question that can be answered um, with crystal clarity until the day when the society is given a canonical status in the church. Um, so, so until that happens, I think there's still going to be many people out there who will just see the sort of the soundbite version of this discussion, and, and that is that the society does not have canonical recognition. Um, so, again, I, I mean, um, I, I think it's important for for the, the, the listeners, the viewers, to to understand what the society is about and what motivated the the archbishop, um, and and that is the question of the rights of tradition. Um, we, we are a church that is that is over 2,000 years old, and, and we have this deposit of faith that, that's been handed down through the centuries, and so that traditional faith has the ultimate rights um, in our church. So what the Archbishop wanted to do, besides preserving the traditional Mass, is he wanted to help uh, tradition be re-validated uh, in, in the post-conciliar world. And to this day, um, we may say that tradition does not have full rights in the church. It's still very much constricted. Um, it's, it's almost like you have to have uh, a special pass 
in, in, in order to, to do traditional things. Um, so uh, obviously because of the, the um, sort of interaction between the society and, and Rome, um, over time tradition has been given more rights in the church. Uh, so in, in 2007, um, the Benedict XVI, um, he issued Sumorum Pontificum and he gave um, authorization for the traditional mass to be said in certain circumstances. All right. Um, and that was because of, uh, as I say, uh, uh, the, the society's activity. There was a um, interaction between Rome and, and, and the society. And, and one of the things that... Um, the society asks, is like, can you please um, authorize the traditional mass to be said around the world? And can you please say um, that the bishops of the society are not excommunicated? And, and to the credit of Pope Benedict XVI, he, he did that. Um, and and that, that goes to show, at least the first request goes to show, that the society really desires that tradition be given full rights in the church. And we have to, what, again, what we have to recognize is that it has not yet happened um, such that anybody anywhere in the world um, can have access to those traditional sacraments that actually match up with the constant history of the church uh, as opposed to be, having to be subjected to uh, the new mass. So the society um, has a measure of freedom in um, making tradition accessible to people around the world that the fraternity of St. Peter does not. Um, so we, we do believe that the, the tra these traditions of the church, they do have rights, even though they've been, they're being um, unjustly shackled. And so for the society to provide to people around the world um, these traditional resources that, that have rights even beyond the, the sanctions of, of the Pope um, cannot be wrong. Um, it, it can't be wrong for, for people to make use of the traditions of the church um, that have not been abrogated um, and um, are, are just being unjustly shackled. So um, I, I, I really, um, it, it pains me <laughs> when people come to me you know, and they're like, Father, um, the mass you have is so beautiful. Um, I, I really feel at, at home there. I feel spiritually nourished and so on. But I'm so afraid of, of making use of those resources um, be, because, you know, you, you don't have a canonical status. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and then they're, they're sort of sacrificing the welfare of their own soul um, for, out, of, out of a certain legalistic fear. I even talked to someone um, uh, one time who was attending the, the Novus Ordo Mass, and, and he said, you know, I, um, I, I understand, I, I get what you're saying, and I, and I, and I agree with you, but, but I feel it's, it's kind of like my duty to, to go down with the ship. Hmm. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's like I, if, if the ship's sinking, I, I, I feel like I would betray uh, the Pope by by abandoning that and, and getting on on that lifeboat of, of tradition. Right. Um, so he's sacrificing the interests of his own soul um, for a, a certain um, legalistic uh, obeisance, you know. Yeah. Father, do you mind um, if a lot of people are asking about it in the in the live chat and would you mind if if I or you went through the 1983 Code of Canon Law, it's Canon 1323, on the question of whether Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre was actually excommunicated, uh, Lete Sententiae, um, because as someone pointed out to me, I, I read 1323, and after I got to the seventh point on it, I said it's absolutely impossible that Archbishop Lefebvre received an excommunication, Lete Sententiae, because if you read canon law, it's clear that it's impossible for it to happen. Do you want me to read that section in English, or do you want to cover sure. that? Sure, absolutely. You want me to read it? Sure. Okay, so canon 1323, I put it up on the screen for everyone. Let me drop it down a little lower. The um, This explains in canon law, this is the 1983 code, the recent code. 
It says no one is liable to the penalty of excommunication who, when violating a law or precept, number one, has not completed his 16th year of age. So if you're 15, you can't fall <laughs> under the penalty. Number two, was without fault, ignorant of violating the law or precept. Inadvertence and error are equivalent to ignorance. So if you don't know, the penalty of excommunication does not fall upon you. This all makes sense. Number three, acting under physical force or under the impetus of a chance occurrence which the person could not foresee or if foreseen could not avoid. So if I put a, a gun to your head or I hold your hand to the keyboard and make you type out something or something like that, this does, you will not be excommunicated by coerced by force. Now here's the really, this is the important one, folks. Number four, acted under the compulsion of grave fear, even if only relative, or by reason of necessity or grave inconvenience, unless, however, the act is intrinsically evil or tends to be harmful to souls. So here, if you're acting under compulsion of grave fear or by reason of necessity, now Archbishop Lefebvre, after the 1986 Assisi meeting, uh, sensed that not only the liturgy, but the faith, monotheism, was being threatened. And this is what led to the 1988 consecrations. And so you can say that Lefebvre did have grave fear. Now you may think, well, it's totally unjustified. Well, let's keep reading. Number five, acted within the limits of due moderation. Number six, lacked the use of reason. So coma or drunk or on drugs. And number seven, the person thought through no personal fault that some one of the circumstances existed which are mentioned in numbers four or five. So even if there was no crisis, there was no emergency, but Lefebvre in his heart believed that the circumstances existed for grave fear in number four, which is under compulsion of grave fear, he would not be excommunicated. Yes. And I think that's the most important part about that canon. This is a slam most dunk. Number four and number seven are pointing to the dispositions of the one performing the act. Right. They, they say, in order to evaluate whether he was excommunicated, you have to ask what were his dispositions when he performed the act. Um, and it's very clear, whether you uh, agree with Archbishop Lefebvre or not, that he thought that he uh, was necessarily needed to to consecrate these bishops, that it was absolute necessary, uh, absolutely necessary for the church, that he was doing something for the church. And he explicitly um, stated it was not schismatic because he mentioned John Paul II in the canon. He mentioned John Paul in the sermon of that day. He was yeah, there, in writing correspondence very, with John Paul II. So it's very obvious that the inward disposition, which 1983 Code of Canon Law takes into consideration in no, sub point number four and sub point number seven, it's obviously manifest that the, dispens the disposition of Marcel Lefebvre on that day in 1988 removes him from the penalty based on Canon 1323, sub point four and sub point seven. I think it's a slam dunk. I think so as, as well. Um, and, and there's there's other interesting points uh, on the question of, of Canon law. Um, and, and that is the, that Canon 1382 which is the canon which says that um, if you consecrate a bishop without papal mandate, then you are excommunicated. That's that's 1382. Um, so an interesting point about that canon is it it's not in the list of canons of that are have sins against the unity of the church. In canon law, this is not listed as one of the sins against the unity of the church to consecrate a bishop with a, without papal mandate. And those sins are, are the schismatic sins. Those are the schismatic acts. If you look in canon law and you find um, the, the delicts against religion and unity of the church, you would say, if I do one of these things, um, then I'm doing something schismatic. That's canons 1364 to 1369. But the canon 1382, which is the penalty for um, consecrating with a, without papal mandate is, is found in under a different title, and that is the usurpation of ecclesiastical functions and delegs in their exercise. So um, it's just using your ecclesiastical power in the wrong way. Right. So, so even in canon law, it implies that this is not 
a schismatic act of itself to consecrate a bishop. But people will say, well, look, the they Pope say said John was, Paul II said it was a schismatic that's, act, that's, that's, therefore that's it has to be. It. Yes, yeah, but I mean, we have to understand that um, just because you put something on, on paper, even if you're a high authority, it doesn't mean it's, it's necessarily true. Um, so for instance, you can have a Pope or um, some post conciliar hierarch say, the new mass is completely in conformity with the constitution of the church. But, but the fact that you state something doesn't make it true. Um, a statement has to actually correspond with reality. And what is ironic in that um, document, Ecclesia Dei Afflicta, that, that came after the consecrations, is that precisely it does not honor that, that legislation of canon law that considers the subjective dispositions of the one performing the act. So, so you, in all this, um, these delicts, these uh, things that are said against the society um, by by John Paul II, he's not willing to to consider the subjective dispositions and and what f uh, factor they might um, have on whether or not he was excommunicated. Right. Yeah, I mean that's the when when we get into these um, debates and the apologetics on both sides that. The two, the p two big bombs, I think, that are used against the society is the 1988 statement uh, in, it's in the documents Ecclesia Dei, isn't it, where he says schismatic act? Yes. 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 Uh, is that one. And I think just a clear reading of the 1983 Code of Canon Law shows that Marcel Lefebvre did not receive a late sententia ex uh, excommunication. And John Paul II never put a direct excommunication on him. So I think there's, th there's that Canon 1323 is is so important. The other one that I see thrown around a lot is a quote from Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. I need to open it up here. It's the um, "has no legitimate ministry" quote, which is actually a, a bad translation of the Latin. So you hear a lot of people, uh, and and my respect to Michael Voris, he's not an enemy, but he often quotes this. This quote from 2009, it's from Pope Ben the 16th, that the society has no canonical status in the church and its ministers, even though they have been freed of all ecclesiastical penalty, penalty, have no legitimate ministry in the church. And that's the quote that's used over and over. No legitimate ministry, no legitimate ministry. But the Latin is, et eos ministry nullum ministerium legitime agere posunt. And legitimate here is not a adjective it's saying legitimately i should put the latin on the screen um do you want to explain the difference in on that father it's not saying no legitimate ministry it's saying it's referring to a canonical status um right right so um there's no legal structure that the society has um, right. And that's that's a fact that we don't have a canonical structure. Um, but it doesn't mean we, you have no legitimate ministry like in English, how we say legitimate. That's not what it, the Latin is saying. It doesn't mean that our sacraments yeah. are not valid. It doesn't mean that we're not valid priests. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't nourish souls through our ministry or, or, that or God anything disapproves. Like that. Um, it's just saying that we don't have a canonical status and we're, we're more than happy to admit that. Um, but even if if someone were were to say that that we don't have a canonical status, things have changed after that statement by Benedict XVI, as, was, as right. we mentioned. Um, so we have actually been given legal rights to perform the sacraments of of the Church um, under Pope Francis. So so even that, even if if someone wants to argue that um, there's there's absolutely no lawful performance of the sacraments by priests of the society. Um, that's different today than it was when Pope Benedict was was speaking. Yeah, yeah it, it's it's that 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 quote gets pulled out over and over and over. I've seen it on Twitter all last week, and like you said, I it the that English quote does not follow the Latin. It's incorrect translation. And then secondly, on top of that, as you stated, the relationship with the Society of Saint Pius X did not freeze in two thousand nine. A lot of things happened in 2015 and then beyond up until 17 and 18 in our own time. So we can't just enshrine this one quote, which is a bad translation from Benedict XVI, 
and make that just like the end of the story. That's, people just are like dropping that like a trump card. And it's I think it's just dishonest. Yeah, and again, I mean, it's it's just the easy way out to just take that label and say right. no canonical status. Therefore, right. you know, end of story. Yeah. Um, without making those proper distinctions and without getting into that broader discussion, which is so important, um, and, and that is what rights do does tradition have in the church? I mean, if if Pope Francis tomorrow was going to say, would would legislate and say the traditional mass is now forbidden. I rescind Sumorum Pontificum. Right. What would people around the world do? Um, would they say, well, I mean, I guess that's it. You know, we can't have the traditional right. mass anymore. Um, they would be in that exact same position that, that we are. Um, and, and again, I mean, I'm asking the question, do the priests of the Society of St. Pius X have a right to provide the traditional sacraments to Catholics around the world, or do we not? Um, do, do Catholics have a right to have access to those traditional sacraments, even independent of, of what um, the Pope is saying. If, if you've got that person who's two minutes away from a society mass, mm -hmm. does he have the right to avail himself of, of those sacraments? Um, does tradition have rights in the church, um, and, and does, does the Pope ever have the right to, to legislate against tradition? Um, by the, and, and by these traditional practices, I mean what the church has, has always done. As, as opposed to the Novus Oral Mass, which is a radical innovation and, and these, these radical new uh, catechisms and, and uh, other sacraments that, that have been modified in such a way that they at least hide um, the fullness of, of what the church teaches and therefore are injurious to the faith, um, at least over, over an extended period of time, um, are, are definitely will, will water down the faith. Yeah. And, and, and you had mentioned the non-canonical status, and that, that kind of freaks people out. They're like, well, does that mean that you're illicit? What's going on there? People just remember, when, when Francis of Assisi was walking around Assisi with 11 or 12 guys, and he was their religious superior and guiding them and, and leading them in a life of piety, they had no canonical status. They were irregular, in a sense. Am I right, Father? Until they made Francis a deacon, and gave them canonical structure and Pope, I think it was Innocent the Third, maybe not, I can't remember, but he said, yes, you have a rule and a constitution that's approved. They were kind of, I mean, Francis technically didn't have ecclesial authority to lead these men until that happened. I mean, there are times in the church where there's not canonical status that's clear. It doesn't mean that it's bad or evil. Yes, absolutely. Um, and... I, I, one of my favorite examples, because I, I spent 10 years in Australia, is uh, the example of, of uh, St. Mary of the Cross. She was a, a nun, an Australian nun, who was, was canonized uh, by Benedict XVI. Um, but she, um, she founded an order of, of nuns, and the, the structure of her order was that they would have uh, a mother general who would be over the order. And there was uh, you know, sort of in the wild days of Australia when the church was just starting. And there was these bishops who were wanting to sort of take over that order and say, no, you're going to be under the bishop. Um, but the thing is, she had been to Rome um, and she had gotten approval for their rule. And, and they, they had made vows to be faithful to this rule. Um, and there was, there was a certain bishop in one of the dioceses who said to her, no, you know, look, you all have to to uh, modify your rule, and you have to be under me um, as your superior. And you can't be um, this this order that's under Rome, but you have to be under the local bishop. Um, and she said, "Well, Your Excellency, I'm I'm sorry, but but you know this is what we've sworn before God to observe this this rule." And he said, "You're excommunicated. <laughs> You're excommunicated." Yeah, you know, um, and after that um, she realized, of course, that, that um, it was not uh, legitimate. What the bishop had done was, was not legitimate and the, the excommunication did not hold force. And the Jesuits in the town realized the same thing. And they continued to, to give her the sacraments um, in that period when she was quote unquote excommunicated. Okay. Um, and it's just striking to me that later on uh, she was vindicated by the church. Um, so again, it's just a, a very key example to show that there are situations when there is abuse of power 
on the part of the hierarchy. And when the faithful um, and, and, and priests and, and religious have a right to um, continue what, doing what they're doing um, because the, the authority has overstepped its bounds. And, and, and it does come back to that question, does the Pope have the right to forbid me to make use of the traditional practices of the church and instead um, make me make use of innovative practices that do not line up with the constant belief of the church. Yeah. And of course, I mean, for us, he doesn't. He right. doesn't. Does, does quote Pius V and quote Primum come in on this? I mean, there, a pope did say that the, the, the traditional mass can never be abrogated. I mean, does that, does that play a part in the argument of the society? It does. Um, it, it very much does. Um, <clears throat> so in that, that legislative instrument, um, we say that the Pope canonized the Mass. He, he made it a, a, a rule in, in perpetuity. Um, so he wanted to, to fix the Mass, and that doesn't mean that, that um, the Missal can never be changed. I mean, the Missal is changed every time you add some saints, or you, like you add St. Joseph to the canon. Um, we, we say uh, the 1962 Missal, which is, which is changed in some minor aspects from the, the Missal of 1570, promulgated um, by Pius V. Um, so he's not saying that, but he's saying that, that this Mass... Um, He's authorizing that this mass represents the, the constant tradition of the church. And when we, we came to 1969, um, it was clear that there was never any attempt on the part of the Vatican to abrogate uh, that missal. So if you want um, to use the proper legal instruments to forbid the traditional missal, what you have to say is this missal is abrogated. Um, you can you can uh, derogate it, and that means you, you put it below uh, some, some other practice. You make it secondary, or you can abrogate it. You can just set it aside. Um, but to abrogate it is that you can't use this. Right. And that was never done. Um, and, well, it was claimed so, it was done, was it, right, Father? I mean, it was claimed. It was definitely claimed. If you went it to was 1971, done. a time machine, and poll bishops on planet Earth, I'm guessing 99% would say, yeah, it's abrogated. You can't do that. It's a sin to say the old math. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but the fact is that the legislation of quo primum was still in force, even after the new mass was promulgated, because quo primum was not rescinded. Um, the Ar archbishop appealed to quo primum and said, well, this legislation is still in force. It gives me a right to celebrate traditional mass. And all he heard from, from the Vatican was, no, 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 you know, right. you must obey. And it's like, well, you know, the, 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 there's, there's no... Uh, proper abrogation of the traditional mass. And um, thanks be to God that, that the, the archbishop, as I say, continued to, to celebrate the traditional mass. And uh, he, was, he was persecuted severely for that. I, I mean, they, they so wanted him to celebrate that new mass. I don't know if you, uh, if you, if you know the story of, of when he was in these negotiations with Rome in order to get authorization to consecrate a bishop. It was getting closer and closer to the date of the consecrations. And the Vatican sent one of his former students. He was a seminary professor in Africa. Um, so one of his uh, former students was now a cardinal, Cardinal Tiendum. Um, and they sent him to Icon and, uh, with a, a new missal, with the, the 1969 missal, and, and, and had the cardinal go to him and say, um, Your Grace, all you have to do is just just say this one time, you know, in just Latin. Celebrate. say it in Latin, <laughs> just celebrate it one time yeah. and, and everything will be good. You know, this, this, this temptation, they just wanted him to, to celebrate um, that new mass because obviously they were not happy at the stance he was taking uh, against it. Um, but he remained faithful to that in the midst of, of loss of reputation in the midst of the, the immense persecution he received. And then he died. Um, and then, then of course, um, you, you come along uh, to 2007, and, and Benedict XVI um, issues a document, Summum Pontificum, where he says the traditional Mass was never abrogated. Um, so at that point, 
he's saying that all along the archbishop was correct, that quo primum was still in force. And all during that time when he was being told he had no right to celebrate the mass, um, that he did have a right to celebrate the mass. So how can we fault him after the fact right. um, when when Benedict XVI used the proper uh, legislative instruments to clarify for us? I mean, uh, effectively, Paul VI and John Paul II just wouldn't answer the question. Um, and and this, this question was, was posed. And at one point, there was a commission that, that um, the, the Pope asks. I think it was under John Paul II. He asked um, certain of his theologians to get together and say, uh, decide whether it had been abrogated or not. And they said it wasn't um, at that time. Um, and yeah, yet the, the Pope w- was not willing to, to state that uh, publicly or legislate that publicly as Benedict XVI was. Um, because let's face it, Taylor, I mean, in the end, um, this is a very politically charged issue. Um, so there's so much more going on than the question of um, whether to say the traditional mass or not to say the traditional mass. What's at stake here is the legitimacy of the Second Vatican Council and the reforms that came after it. So the Vatican has known that if at any point they give legitimacy to these traditional practices, um, they will call into question, ultimately, uh, the whole Vatican II enterprise and all these these radical innovations, and that's the last thing they want to do. Um, so the Archbishop was willing to take the hit uh, for that over all those years and um, he has been vindicated at, at this point. One, one, uh, one topic that I'd like for you to settle once and for all, Father Robinson, is the question of full communion. Now, when I was an Anglican, when I was a heretic, when I was outside the church, we would always talk about, well, we're in partial communion with this diocese in South America because they have, you know, maybe women priests, but we're in full communion with the Anglican Church in Uganda. We had all this gray fuzziness everywhere. I understand that the Catholic doctrine, correct me if I'm wrong, is being in communion is like you're pregnant. You either are pregnant or you're not pregnant. You're not partially pregnant on the way to being pregnant. You either have a baby in you or you're not. It's like an electrical current. It's either live, switched on, or it's switched off. So a lot of people are saying SSPX is in partial communion. I reject that. I say they're in full communion because you're either in communion with Rome or you're not. And if you ask anyone in the society, they say we're in communion with Rome. Otherwise, you wouldn't be Catholic. Am I right or wrong on this? You're, you're absolutely right, Taylor. I mean, this is, this is one of the... <clears throat> Um, novel ideas that was introduced with the council uh, um, as part of the ecumenical movement. So historically, the church has always said you're either in communion with the church or you're not in communion with the church. It's a binary thing. It's a black and white thing. There are no shades of gray. Um, There's no partial um, adherence to the church. You're either in or you're out. I mean, the very use of excommunication indicates that. I mean, if if you're outside the communion, then you got a zero. I mean, if you're yeah. inside the community, you got a 100. Yeah. Um, that's it. That's There's it. no other possibility. But with one of the the innovations of the Second Vatican Council, um, and this this sort of contradicted mortalium animos of, of Pius XI, the encyclical of Pius XI, was they what they wanted to to somehow say um, that these non-Catholic religions had some legitimacy, um, that somehow these religions were on the way to the fullness of the truth, and that as a religion, um, they could save your soul. Um, Before, the church would say that people could be saved in a non-Catholic religion, Mm -hmm. but only in spite of that religion, not because they were following that religion, but insofar as they deviated from that religion and adhered to Catholicism. That's the only way they could be saved. Um, but the Second Vatican Council wanted to say that these religions of themselves, especially in Nostra Aetate and Unitatis Redintegratio, um, that these religions of themselves are vehicles of salvation. Why are they vehicles of salvation? Because they have something of the truth. They have something of communion with the church. 
Um, and so it's it's like it's like one of those bullseyes, you know, where where at the center you've got the Catholic Church, and and around that center you've got other circles, and sort of irradiating from it, and you've got partial uh, approximation to that. And of course they do the same thing with with morality uh, today. You know, the, the, they'll say like the divorced remarried who are back together, they, they're on their second. Uh, wife or, or second husband and they're having children well you know i mean they have something of a legitimate marriage in that and so we have to look at the good in yeah, that right. um so that's just isolating one aspect um, uh, of of this relationship and not considering it in its totality in its totality it's bad of course it has something good of it i mean everything that has being has something good of it even the right. devil right. <laughs> but but in its totality it's bad and, and that's the way the the um, church historically, doctrinally, has always seen false religions. As false religions, they are bad. They lead to damnation. Yeah. And so they are they are not in communion with the church. Um, so I think that would be uh, representative of the, of the constitution of the church. And you have to say um, the Society of St. Pius X is either in the church or outside the church. Right. Um, partial communion just, just does not, it's not a category that really makes any sense. Yeah, yeah it's binary. And if, if you say, let's trail this out, if you say the Society of St. Pius X is out of communion with the church, not in communion with Rome, that means that Pope Francis granted faculties with schismatics. Yes, yes. So now we have um, a really big problem that the pope is licensing schismatics to minister to the faithful of the catholic church this is that would be super scandalous that would be super scandalous yeah. um and i mean let's let's face it it, it it is a very confusing situation i mean we're we're sort of in a canonical vacuum um logically speaking <clears throat> um we um Yes, would have a canonical structure. It's it's just very very weird mm -hmm. um, for the Pope to to grant us uh, faculties for confessions and and marriage and and for us not to have a canonical structure. Um, I, I think, you know, obviously there's there's um, some some difficulties on on both sides that, that need to be resolved. And so in the meantime, we have this this sort of canonical limbo that that we're in. Um, but the fact that that um, Pope Francis has been willing to give us these faculties, I think, fully indicates that he considers us Catholic. And I believe he's even stated that. I mean, it's it's more on, on the personal level; it's not on the public level that he stated that. But but um, he's been happy to say that, that yes, of course, we're Catholic. Yeah. Well, I've also heard that Bishop Follet was included as a a judge or a juror. I don't know what the right term is uh, on cases. In Rome, can you can you explain exactly what what that means or what exactly happened with Bishop Fillet? Yes, well, I mean, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, of course, in the society, we, we, um, the society priests are uh, we're not saints, and uh, we've got we're, we're composed of human beings just like any other order. And sometimes it's it's rare, but there are some cases in which uh, a priest uh, leave leave the society and and, and even leave the priesthood. Um, and I, um, there's cases of, of laicization of, of priests. Um, and I, I believe what you're referring to, Taylor, is um, where the Pope, if I'm not mistaken, um, made uh, Bishop Follet one of the ones who would, would judge whether the, the priest should be laicized. Um, yeah, so I hope I'm not confusing this, <clears throat> but it was it was that situation or, or some other juridical situation where a decision had to be made about um, things that go on in, in the society of St. Pius X. And, you know, historically, the, the popes have, um, if, if, if the popes treat the society of St. Pius X as a juridical entity, um, and is saying, we're going to work with you in order to decide juridically um, internal policies, then we're acting as if the society has a canonical structure. If we received a canonical structure later on, we would be under the Pope, and there would be uh, situations, just like in, in any situation where you have a superior, where you have to refer decisions to the superior. 
Um, and sometimes the superior will say to you, well, I'm going to delegate you to make that decision. And that's effectively what's happening here. Pope is delegating Bishop Follet to, to do that. And there's, there's another situation that's not so well known, um, and that's the question of some Dominican nuns in New Zealand um, who requested Rome that, that they might be um, established as a, an order under the umbrella of the Society of St. Pius X, um, these Dominican nuns of Whanganui, New Zealand. And, and the Pope granted that request. And so, so these nuns <laughs> have, been in, have been authorized <laughs> to have their sort of canonical existence under That's the Society of St. Pius And, and when did that happen? What year did that happen? That's a big deal. Yeah, um, I'm, I don't have the, the date, I'm afraid, um, Taylor. I, I, I think it was probably around 20 years ago, around, around oh, wow. that ballpark. And then yeah. isn't, there, isn't there a Swiss bishop that's now living with the society in, in Switzerland? Yes, Bishop Vitus Wander mm -hmm. um, is a, a former diocesan bishop of one of the dioceses in uh, Switzerland. And again, he, he requested the Vatican for permission to, to effectively live his retirement um, with the Society of St. Pius X. And, and the Vatican um, gave him permission to do that. So, right. so again, um, at the practical level, um, there are many, many cases where the Vatican treats us as an entity that has canonical structure. So the only thing that's lacking is, is the actual legislation to, to um, give us that structure. Um, so it, we can look at, the, at these practical details and, and see very clearly that they, the Vatican considers us to be fully Catholic. Yeah. Now, with regard to canonical status, what document or signature would it take for Rome to say the society is canonically regular? I mean, Bishop Schneider even said regular probably isn't even the right term anymore. I can't remember exactly what he said uh, in the book Christus Vincit, but are you guys regular? And if not, what's it gonna, what would it take? I'm not saying that it should be done. I'm just saying, what what would it be? A, just a papal doc? Yes, it would. Okay. It would take a, a papal document. I think it would be an apostolic constitution that would establish mm -hmm. us as a personal prelature. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a canonical instrument um, that was uh, only introduced in the new code of canon law. There's only one personal prelature out there right now, and that is Opus Dei. It just uh, hap so happens that the personal prelature. Uh, is the best sort of canonical fit. To the, if you look at these different canonical structures, you can think of them having different shapes and sizes. Um, so the, the society has a certain shape and size, and the canonical structures have a certain shape and size, and the personal prelature is, is the one that the best uh, matches exactly on top of what the society is uh, right now. Um, but it, it is a difficult thing um, because that's the whole enchilada, Taylor. I mean, that that's... That's where we, we actually reach the point uh, to where tradition to a large degree is given full legitimacy in the church. And that's, that's a huge step um, for the church and for um, the traditionalist movement. And there's a lot of things um, involved there. <clears throat> and I think the main thing is that, that all along, um, the society has, has a line in the sand. Um, and this line involves various things. Um, we, we, we want to, to have the rights, of course, to adhere to the traditional rights of the church. Um, we, we want to be given authorization um, to, to criticize the Second Vatican Council on the three main points of uh, ecclesiality, uh, religious li liberty, and, and ecumenism, um, and, and continue to, to hold that they are um, in, in contradiction to tradition. Um, and we, we want to be able to continue to uh, maintain our opposition to the new mass. Um, so, I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's very hard right. for, for the Vatican to want to grant that to us, uh, but we feel like we, we can't compromise on that. We would, we would basically deny our very identity and the whole fight that we have um, to, to make tradition once more uh, have the droit de cité, the, 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 the full rights um, that it deserves, um, we, we would feel like we would effectively sell out. 
mm-hmm. um, our, our fight and the church herself if, if we were to move that line. Um, so all the negotiations between Rome and, and society have, have been about uh, where that line is, is going to be. And it, I mean, if, if the Vatican were willing to come up to that line, we would be very, very happy. We would be uh, overjoyed <laughs> um, to, to have that, that canonical status. But as yet, um, it, it seemed that for, for a little bit under Pope Francis that that might happen. Um, but then um, Cardinal Mueller came out and, and said, no, you, you know, you guys not only have to say that the new mass is valid, because we're more than happy to say that the new mass um, is a valid mass, you know, it has a valid consecration. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you, he wanted us also to say that the new mass is licit. In other words, the new mass mm-hmm. is something that's holy um, in the sight of God. And that, that's just something we, in conscience we, we can't do. Um, okay. It's against our very nature. So there was a lot there, and, and I want to I want to capture it because it, it helps me. Again, I'm I'm not a long term Society of Saint Pius like tenth guy. I've only been you know because of Corona, I've been attending for a month now. But um, I'm I've been a Fraternity of Saint Peter guy for a decade. The the distinctions or the points at which you guys have with Rome that's not that's sort of the barrier between canonical status are. The three errors that you discern in the Second Vatican documents, which are collegiality, religious liberty, and ecumenism. And then also, you don't say that the new Mass is an invalid consecration, but you do say that the new Mass is not illicit. Was there anything else in there? I, I tried to, to type it down while you were talking. Was there anything else that I missed? No, th- those are okay. the main points, yes. And I had heard that... that um, under Benedict, maybe it was under Francis with Mueller, but that you guys were given some sort of like document of like things you had to accept. Is that true or not? Like yes. Th- okay. So this is look. There there have been many. Is it public? Can we see it? Um. No. Okay. No. All right. That's what um, I thought. So there have been uh, many proposed documents uh, for the regularization of of the society. And they, they start with a certain uh, doctrinal preamble. Um, it's, it's a certain profession of faith. Um, at times, the Vatican has said, okay, you just have to make the profession of faith of Trent. We're like, hey, no, no problem at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, at other times, they, they say, well, no, you've got to profess that the new Mass is licit, um, that it's pleasing, effectively, it's pleasing to God. And, and we're like, no, I mean, in conscience, we, we can't do that. Um, and so that's that's been a sort of a stopping point for us. Um, but you know, I fully would suspect that that if if the Vatican ever said that um, we would we'd be able to maintain our position on Vatican II um, and our, our on the new Mass, that we would be very happy to accept the the personal prelature. Um, so, and I think this would be a wonderful uh, uh, healing for the Church to have officially recognize within the church uh, a body of priests who um, are uh, able or permitted to criticize the, Vat- the Second Vatican Council in the way that we do. So um, the, the, the main difference from, from our position, in, and I think from the position of Fraternity of St. Peter, is that we feel like there are actual errors in the documents themselves. Um, that there's no way to make those documents continuous with tradition in certain points, in those three points. So uh, Benedict the, the 16th was always wanting this hermeneutic of continuity. Um, find the way to take these documents and make them fit with the traditions of the church. Right. Um, and and we, we were always saying, this is just not possible. And we asked to have doctrinal discussions with the Vatican, and the Vatican uh, granted those with us. You know, we were very grateful for, for that. Um, but in the end, um, the, we, we reached an impasse um, because effectively what the Vatican said to us was, was look, um, yeah, we, we can't really show you how these documents are continuous, but why don't you help us? do that <laughs> why don't you help us come up with this hermeneutic of continuity and and we're kind of like well i mean it's our position that, that there is no hermeneutic of, of continuity on those three points i mean other things of the vatican documents we can we can find a way to square them with tradition but not on those three points yeah yeah 
Yeah, that's that's something that uh, you know in my own. You know, I'm a convert, and I wasn't raised Catholic. I wasn't raised in the traditional Catholic faith. So, you know, as as I've been a Catholic and read and studied, you know, I was certainly anyone who who's been following me for years certainly probably in the in the in the mid 2000s and into the teens was definitely okay. Let's get this hermeneutic continuity. I know it's really hard. I know we're pushing you know, square pegs and around holes, but we got to get our sandpaper out. We got to make this fit. We got to get it to work. And then, I mean, really, I think it was 2018, 2019. I just threw it my hands. I'm like, I'm tired of having to do all this extra work to make the Novus Ordo regime look like it fits with the traditional because it doesn't. Everyone knows that. You just put a Novus Ordo mask next to a, a TLM, you know, put the documents, you know, just put modern theology books that are being used in diocesan seminaries up against Catholic theology books and manuals from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they're different. They're different. We've had a change. A change has happened. Yeah, I mean, that that question of full communion and partial communion is a perfect example. Exactly. I mean, it's either one or the other. I mean... um, is it the teaching of the church that you're either in or out, mm-hmm. or is it the teaching of the church that there is this gradual approach um, to communion that you can have, you know, like 55% communion, 25% communion? Um, how can we be teaching something completely different about that from 1965 onwards? Um, and where is where is the real teaching of the church? And um, how can we reconcile the two? I mean, sometimes you hear the language, especially under under Pope John Paul II, of a deeper awareness that that, that with Vatican II we came to a deeper awareness. And, and and our our issue with that is is that when you have a deeper awareness, it's in line with what you were aware of before. You know, <laughs> it's not in contradiction. You can't call it a deeper awareness if it's in contradiction with your former awareness. It's a different awareness, not a deeper awareness. Yeah. Let's uh, circle back to the um, the pastoral question, if you can be pastoral for his father, and that is, someone's watching, and uh, you know, let's let's be honest, 2018, 2019, 2020 has been a shakeup for a lot of people, a lot of people who just assumed everything's going well with with Cardinal McCarrick and that disaster, financial scandals, sexual scandals, doctrinal scandals. Um, the Abu Dhabi document by Pope Francis, uh, the Amoris footnotes on divorce and remarriage and communion, uh, environmentalism. You know, we've the, the current Holy Father has said that the corona is just nature having a tantrum or having a fit. So, like, it's not the Old Testament, you know, of God visiting us with plague because of any sins or faults in us, but it's nature personified. These are all contrary to the Catholic faith. Um, any third party who studied c- historic Catholicism realized these things don't fit into traditional Catholicism. And so I think people are now, I think because of Francis and McCarrick and things like what Vigano is saying and Schneider, are now ready to hear a traditional argument. And not only are they ready to hear, hey, the Latin Mass is good, they're, for me especially, I wanted to say, well, how did I get this fraternity of St. Peter Mass that I've been going to for 10 years? I know there was the shakedown in 88 with the society and fraternity. But I mean, can I really say that from 1969 to 1988, when the fraternity of St. Peter was created, that there were no licit masses on planet Latin masses on planet Earth? Is that really the argument that I want to make? No, it's not. And as I read the biography of Lefebvre, I was, you know, like we talked about in our previous interview, I was blown away by his sanctity, his apostolic zeal, his missionary efforts, his uh, devotion to the traditional doctrine during the 60s in the Second Vatican Council, and then just his his stalwart courage in the 70s in upholding the traditional liturgy. So I realized, even as a guy who goes, who's been nourished in the fraternity of St. Peter, I was always being nourished by the legacy of Lefebvre, whether he denied or not. That's where it came from. From 19, 
1969 to 1988, no matter where you guys are out there in the traditional world, from 1969 to 1988, the guy who carried the torch for that time was Lefebvre. We have to honor and respect that. And I think with the recent changes and pronouncements of Francis, with regard to the society, I think we all need to tip the hat and say, we can't, we can't dog the Society of St. Pius X. We certainly can't dog Lefebvre. Absolutely not, you know. Um, and I, I think it's a very interesting time for me um, because so, sometimes, you know, it's it's difficult um, being the the uh, the one who's on the uh, the out, you know, who's being ostracized. I mean, um, one of the most frustrating things for me as as a society priest who's been ordained to help souls is that sort of uh, gotcha label that that people just put on us it's like you're you know you're outside the church so we don't we don't even give you the time of day um so in in that sense we are not able to access uh as many souls as as we would like um when when i i think that's that's a a, a bit unfair um <clears throat> so it's interesting for me um that that pope francis has not only done something for us in giving us um, jurisdiction to perform the sacraments, but he's done something for us in being so scandalous <laughs> in his pontificate. Um, people are starting to realize that, hey, maybe all along the society was right in saying that there is a crisis in the church. Um, and so a lot of people are having that SSPX moment um, where, where they're saying to themselves, I think Archbishop Lefebvre was actually right yeah. um, all along. Um, and. I, I, I would caution people at the same time. Sometimes when I when I see them having this SSPX moment, and, and I've seen it so many times, people start drifting further in our direction, and sometimes they just keep going, you know, and so they sort of head off the cliff. You mean like <laughs> into, into Saint or stay stay home, right. uh, Catholics, home, alone. uh, home aloneers, you know, um, and, and we have to approach this uh, situation with the proper balance, and I, I think that's. That's one another aspect of the legacy of the Archbishop that I'm so grateful for um, is that he was able to handle a crisis situation with a lot of prudence and balance. Um, as, as I mentioned, this was one of the characteristics of, of the Archbishop, according to his sister, from, from the early days. He was so prudent and balanced in his decisions. Um, so we, we, we shouldn't overreact um, to the scandals of Pope Francis. Um, by saying, you know, uh, it's not possible for any pope to ever do this. The pope has no limitations. You know, if he's not holy, he's not pope, um, that sort of thing. Um, and at the same time, we must not underreact and, and just say, well, I mean, if, if the pope um, says we worship Pacamama, we worship Pacamama, you know. Right. Um, so I, I think um, an illustration, might, if, if, you, if you don't mind me giving an example uh, for this, um, and, and that is <clears throat> when it comes a question of of following law, um, you know the the thing that the the reason for the law um, is is to to attain some good, um, and the reason why we obey the Pope um, is in order to attain the good, the salvation of souls. You have to have hierarchy, you have to have authority in in order for the church to be an organized structure. Um, but if there are situations in which the law gets in the way of the purpose of the law, um, then you need to serve that purpose of the law. You need to you need to put the law aside in order to attain the purpose of the law. So um, I give the example of, of driving on a, on a highway in the United States. You know, we all know if you've got the double yellow lines on the highway, right. don't cross. you're not allowed to cross over into the other lane. If you've got a two lane highway, you've got the double lines, you're not allowed to cross over. Okay, but what if you got a white-tailed deer, you know, right there in the in the in the middle of your lane? Do you say to yourself, well, I mean, the law says I can't go over across over the line. Yeah. Um, it, or if a cop you saw say, you, well, no. he'd write you a ticket up for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't want to break the law, so I'm just going to slam into this deer and endanger my life. No, the law is there. That law for the double line is there in order to preserve your life on the road. Um, that's the purpose, so you don't endanger your life in crossing over, and it, because it's not safe to pass at that time. Um, but in this case, if you follow the law, you're endangering your life. So, so you need to break the law in order to serve the purpose of the law. Um, and 
And what you want to do when you break that law is you don't want to you don't want to go too far. <laughs> you don't want to go off the road. Right. You know, it's like I'm going to go off across the double lines and into the ditch. That's that's not the way you want to break the law. You want to break the law in such a way that you still serve the purpose of the law. Um, so th- this is what our position is, has always been. I mean, we uh, know that, that when it comes to a question of the faith, um, we have to preserve our faith. And if the Pope mandates something that's, that's against the faith, then, um, you know, we have a duty to, to disobey. But in all other things, we, we have to strive to obey the Pope as far as possible. Um, we don't we just want to say, uh, because the Pope Francis is scandalous, we just don't pay any attention to him. Uh, we just completely forget about him. I mean, that would be going off the road. Effectively, we would we would be schismatic in that case. So we still recognize the authority of the Pope. But if he tells us um, to, uh, you know, worship Pacamama or say the new mass, we, we would say, sorry, Holy Father, respect your authority. But in this case, um, I, I, I can't endanger my faith. Um, just like a, a child, if, if if the if the father tells him to take out the trash, even though he's a drunkard, um, then he has to do it. But if he t- if he tells him um, to steal some alcohol, uh, he must not do it. So there there is that balance to be kept in this crisis. We 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 only uh, disobey if if the faith is being endangered. In the rest, we we respect the pope and we follow the pope as far as possible. Yeah, it's it. People are often shocked, you know, when they when they visit your the SSPX website and they see a picture of Pope Francis, or they visit a chapel and there's a framed picture of Pope Francis. And some of them are shocked that that you say the name Francis in the canon. And it's also my understanding that you say the name of the local diocesan bishop in the canon. Is that correct? That's correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Be- because we recognize them as legitimately holding the office that they possess. And we do recognize their authority. We're not schismatics. <clears throat> the Pope is the Pope. Um, but at the same time, we recognize that that authority is not absolute. Um, that just because the Pope says it, then it's automatically right. And there are certain situations in which it's easy to say, it's very easy for people to recognize that, that what the Pope is asking us to do um, is is. Uh, contrary to the faith and endangering the faith. And in such cases, um, we, we even have a duty to, to not follow. Right. Right. Awesome. Can I ask two quick questions from the crowd before we hang okay. up? Uh, the first is, sure. can the priests of the Society of St. Pius X perform exorcisms? Yes. I mean, well, obviously, um, a priest does does exorcisms on, on a regular basis whenever he, he performs a baptism. Um, in the traditional baptism, there's three exorcisms um, uh, of the child, and there's there's even an exorcism of the salt <laughs> that's used, put in the child's mouth. There's an exorcism uh, when you make holy water. Um, but as far as exorcism of people who are uh, possessed or possibly possessed, um, no, I would never do that okay. um, without getting authorization from my superior. If I thought that someone of my parishioners um, it, we're possessed, and um, I, I have no reason to think that any of my, <laughs> my parishioners are possessed. Right. Um, then I would I would request permission from my superior uh, in order to, before I would perform an exorcism because it's just a, a very uh, dangerous thing to to wrestle with the devil. Right. Yes, my understanding that all bishops are exorcists and they may delegate it to a priest. So the Society of Saint Pius X, the bishop would delegate that to. What you're saying is a, a bishop of the society would delegate that to a priest if needed for a major exorcism. Well, I, actually, it's it's not the bishops who possess authority as such in in uh, our society. Uh, they they have a certain sacramental authority, um, but we we have positions of authority like district superior. So I would go to the district superior, and maybe he would go to the superior general, and both of those are are priests. Um, so so in other words, in our in our structure, our canonical structure as it's supposed to be, um, the hierarchical chain is not on, um, based on bishops. It's, it's based on uh, those who hold certain offices, um, and they have the ones, they're the ones that have the authority. So a district superior would be the equivalent of, of a bishop for us as far as authority is concerned, but of course not as far as administering sacraments is concerned. Yes. Okay. And then the, the one more question is, um, do you foresee the society creating new bishops anytime in the near future? Um, I've, I've heard no talk of, of uh, 
consecration of bishops as, as of now there is there is no plan for that no but i guess at some point in the future that would unless there's some regularization that would have to happen right well, our, our bishops are not getting any younger, <laughs> that's for sure. I mean, they, they were consecrated in 1988, um, so, you know, that, that's that's uh, a long time ago now, 32 years ago. Um, so, um, yes, eventually something has to happen, yeah. definitely. Okay, sorry, one more question. It's a good one. Why don't the society call their churches parishes, instead call them centers or chapels? This is a good question. Well, I mean... Um, we, since we do not have a, a canonical structure as as yet, um, parish is a jurisdictional term. Um, it indicates that the one who is the the, the pastor there has been uh, delegated um, by by the pope or by the bishop to um, have a, a juridical structure in that parish. <clears throat> so um, we don't yet have that. Um, we. We are waiting for the day when that happens, obviously, and, and the, um, as I say, we, we step much closer to tradition being given full rights in the church, um, but um, until that happens, it's not technically correct to, to call our, our churches parishes. Good, good. Well, great. Father Paul Robinson, thank you so much. Uh, a lot of clarity. Um, you know, just to summarize, we talked about in the very beginning, for those that came in late, is it ever possible to disobey a pope or a bishop. And um, we didn't talk about Thomas Aquinas, but he has an article on it in which he says, of course, it is the case. Um, whenever they command you to do something that's contrary to God's revealed will, um, it can be done. We talked about the dangers of the Novus Ordo. We gave examples of those. We talked about um, the, the demographics and the decrease in attendance and belief in the real presence and transubstantiation uh, lack of belief in the ontological priesthood. We looked at canon law, we looked at canon 1323, we looked at the canons on uh, consecrated bishops. We also looked at all the, the recent papal documents, uh, especially from Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis, um, regarding uh, lifting the excommunications, uh, granting faculty to priests, and how that entails that the priest is not under censure and not a schismatic. Very important details. And uh, then we, we just kind of talked a lot about uh, the identity of the Society of St. Pius X. And, uh, of course, here towards the end, uh, a little bit of, little bit of Q&A. Uh, is there anything that we, that we missed or that you would like to wrap up with, uh, Father uh, Robinson, before we, we pray our Ave Maria and you give a blessing? Um, if maybe, maybe one last thing is if, if, if we can just, uh, I can go very quickly mm -hmm. through the, the dates of yes. the interaction between the society and Rome. And, and that, that gives people, um, uh, a sort of perspective on the trajectory where we're headed, that they were actually headed, mm -hmm. um, towards canonical recognition and the full, uh, rights given to tradition. So, um, in 1976, Archbishop Lefebvre was suspended for running the seminary that did not say the new mass. Um, 1988, he, he went ahead with the consecration of four bishops so that um, the Society of St. Pius X could survive after his death and so continue providing the traditional sacraments to the faithful. Um, after that, there was a sort of cold war. There was there was not much interaction between Rome and the society until the year 2000, when this, the uh, members of the society had a pilgrimage to Rome, and this, the the uh, prelates in Rome were very impressed. And at that point, Rome started speaking to the society again, and this led up to um, the uh, the society requesting the uh, liberation of the traditional mass. And um, the uh, the lifting of, of the supposed excommunications against the bishops of the society. So in 2007, uh, Pope Benedict XVI granted the first request with Sumorum Pontificum, um, making the traditional mass uh, legitimate throughout the world and clarifying that the traditional mass was never abrogated. Um, then in 2008, the Ecclesia Dei Commission again said that those who attend society masses are not committing a sin and they do not incur any canonical penalty. 2009, uh, Benedict XVI declared that the four bishops of society are not excommunicated. Um, then in 2015, 
Pope Francis gave the priests of the society jurisdiction to hear confessions. He, that, that jurisdiction would last for one year. In, in 2016, the next year, he made that jurisdiction permanent. And in 2017, he gave us authorization um, to perform marriages. And we work with the bishops. The society works with the bishops of each diocese in order to get delegation to perform a uh, jurisdictional marriage, a, a marriage that, that is uh, jurisdictionally legitimate. And so that's, that's where we are uh, right now. And um, I, if, I, if I can close by saying that if, if uh, there's anybody in the Denver area um, would like to visit our, our church, they're, they're more than welcome. I'd be happy to meet them and, and we can chat further about these things. Fantastic. Yeah, and I've learned that the society priest that comes down to my neck of the woods here in Texas also uh, lives at the Priory with you in Denver. He does. He does. And um, Father Brueggemann, God bless Father Brueggemann, um, he has been in Texas since March 18th um, <laughs> because of the coronavirus crisis. Um, just really um, being so um, energetic and generous about providing the, the faithful with sacraments, uh, you know, not against the law, but but um, you know, following the law, but using the law and the permissions that are granted as far as possible to provide people spiritual nourishment in this time. Um, and today, um, you know, just in a few hours, he's he's actually going to come back um, to the priory here, and so we'll have him back and um, he's, we greet him, <laughs> hopefully with all the the um, warmth that, that he deserves after all his well, labors. Well, I mean, give so, give him a good good scotch or something. He's been working hard down here. I tell you, he's been hearing confessions around the clock. <laughs> all day yeah. Saturday, all day Sunday, just yeah. in the church, communion, adoration, confessions, communion. Ma I mean, it's just he's he's the young man. The young priest is working hard. Nothing but yeah, respect just, for him. He's only been a priest for two years, and look at all the uh, the, the the hard work that that he's required to do. Um, but we're both from Kentucky, so it's going to be some Kentucky bourbon tonight, Taylor. Good. Kentucky. That's great. <laughs> yeah, my, my wife and I, our first society mass ever we attended was with him. It was a few weeks ago. And he preached this great sermon, and my wife said afterwards, that sermon, because my wife was raised Baptist, she's Catholic now, but she said, you know, I haven't heard a sermon about winning souls and getting souls for the Lord and missionary zeal. And here's this young priest, and he's at a society of St. Pius X, and he's preaching about winning souls, laboring for souls, like St. Paul talks about. Yes. You know, I, the yes. only people I hear out in, in the world that are talking about that study are Archbishop Vigano, Schneider, talking about winning souls, winning souls. So yes. that was a great, um, you know, we went to our first society mass. We're kind of, you know, what's going to happen? Someone going to start judging us or you know, who knows what's going to happen. It was a great experience. And that, that initial homily by father was just, you know, it wasn't about necessarily Corona or any, it was just about yes. how can we connect sinful people with the sacred heart of Jesus? How can we get them the sacraments so that they can be saved, not go to hell, but go into the beatific vision with the Trinity forever? Yes. That's what it's all about. Yeah, and I think that's how we've come full circle, Taylor, because I think that's what we said at the beginning. Look, all, all we want is to save our souls and to save mm -hmm. the souls of as many people as possible. Yeah, that's that's really what we're about, Taylor. That's yep. what it's all about. Yeah, salvation of souls. Yeah. Very good. Well, well, Father, would you please um, lead us in prayer with maybe a Ave Maria and or a, a Gloria Patri and a blessing would be greatly appreciated. Certainly. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tuum mulieribus, benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora per nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filii et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secura secolorum. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, Rishina, Subo Vos, et Mania Semper. Amen. Father Paul Robinson of the Society of St. Pius X, thank you so much for being with us. Please, everyone, like this video. Please share it. If you're on Facebook, Twitter, whatever, just hit the share link. It's right below where Father Robinson is. Please share it online. There's a lot of confusion. And I think if we can just be calm, go through the facts as we did today, I think a lot of the hostility and confusion and name-calling will just go away. Let's just be calm and go through the facts. So please share it. 
please like the video and um, thanks so much everyone for watching. Continue your Easter joy. Christ is risen. Father Robinson, thank you so much. I hope you can come back again. We can talk about other, other things. That would be great, Taylor. Really enjoyed it. Awesome. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. Godspeed. Happy Easter. And we'll see you on Wednesday.